Good morning. Um, thank you all for coming in so promptly. Um, and welcome to our morning's panel discussion on the future of banking and why pay, diversity and inclusion matter. My name is Philip O'Connor. I'm one of the partners here at PwC, working in our people and organisation practice and supporting a lot of our clients with how they think about gender pay and the diversity challenges within their business. We're delighted to have so many of you here today and very conscious you all have very busy lives and so we'll make sure that we get you out of here by 10 o'clock and there's then an opportunity for some further networking up to 10.30 and just outside. In a minute, I'm going to pass over to Joanna Murphy, who's going to chair our panel today, so she can introduce herself and the other panel members can also introduce themselves. But before I do that, I just wanted to set some very brief context on the issue that we're here to talk about today. Two years have now passed since the launch of the Women in Finance Charter, and one year since the gender pay legislation came into force. In combination with other initiatives and regulatory expectations, diversity is really now at the heart of most boards' agendas. Our hope today is to give you the opportunity to hear about the latest research that's been undertaken on this issue, an update on what's happening today, but also hear some practical and pragmatic thinking around what organisations can do next in terms of gripping the diversity challenge. So far, not all bad news. Unquestionably, we've seen progress on diversity and financial services, um, with a number of initiatives beginning to have a material impact on the makeup of leadership within this sector and the approach to diversity within financial services overall. The Women in Finance Charter now has over 200 signatories and with internal targets now for gender diversity within the organisations um, and perhaps more uh, onerous, those organisations publicly reporting on progress against those targets on an ongoing basis. Really positively, we're also seeing women begin to report progress themselves. PwC ran a survey earlier this year where 80% of them, uh, of women who were surveyed, uh, reported that they were confident about their ability to progress um, and fulfil their career aspirations. However, it's clearly the beginning of a journey, and the research that we'll discuss today indicates that. The gender pay gap continues to be most extreme within financial services, at 31%. Um, within financial and insurance institutions. I'm sure John will give us some more of the details on that in a second. Women are worried about their prospects within the, within the sector. Uh, in the same survey, 53% of women surveyed um, were concerned about the impact of children on their career. And that compares to 42% in other sectors. 45% believed an employee's diversity status was a barrier to progression in their organisation comparing to only 45 outside of the sector. So there are major differences, I think, that we need to be conscious of. The Charter Bank Institute latest survey, in partnership with the Finance Foundation on Gender Diversity and Progression, supported this research further, noting significant barriers within organisations to progression. More than 50% of respondents from their survey found barriers with a strong perception that, it was that progression was determined by who you know, Women further um, supported this, uh, saying that men promote through male-dominated networks and that the attitudes of senior leaders were a barrier in terms of women progression. And I'm sure we'll hear much more about that from Hillary in a second. So how much progress is required and how quickly? That's one of the issues that we see hotly debated by boards and I think we'll be discussing today. What you see is the cost-benefit analysis of this as to what the benefits of diversity could be. And here the research is beginning to provide really strong levels of optimism in terms of the opportunities that we can achieve from increased diversity. This indicates that there are both quantitative and qualitative benefits from improved diversity within organisations. On the quantitative side, the evidence suggests that businesses can create both better customer outcomes and importantly, better returns. On the qualitative side, diversity supports increased innovation, the increased ability to attract and retain, and importantly, improvements in reputation and in brand where diversity is improved. There's clearly more to do for organisations to benefit from these opportunities. And bland statements on diversity or sporadic half assed initiatives just simply cannot be enough. I'm genuinely excited by the opportunity today to hear from our incredibly uh, well-informed panel members on their experiences on the current position, but also to give you some thinking around what organisations need to do to accelerate progress on diversity going forward. Gemma. Thank you so much, Philippa. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, 
Thank you um, for attending this morning's session. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to have a series of questions with the panel members. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to get to know them in, in just a minute. Um, and that will be followed by a short opportunity for you to ask some questions um, if, as they arise um, during today's event. Um, my name is Joanne Murphy. I am the Chief Operating Officer for the Charter Banker Institute. The Institute is the world's oldest and last remaining professional body for bankers in the UK. Um, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, I have over 25 years um, experience in financial services. Unfortunately, a number of the topics that we're going to discuss today I've personally experienced during that time, so it's of great interest to me um, that we support um, this um, initiative and agenda. Um, I'm incredibly proud of the Institute's um, membership profile. Um, when it comes to diversity, our membership has greater diversity than the UK average, um, which is great news but we have lots and lots of work to do. Um, when we look at our membership profile in terms of seniority, um, that unfortunately reflects the banking industry rather than our membership. Um, and therefore, as the professional body, it is our role to ensure that we create and support an industry which is sustainable, fair, and produces the very best in ethical practice. And that's why these events are so important in raising awareness for us. Um, I'd like to introduce, first of all, Hilary Cooper, who um, completed some research for the Institute. So, Hilary, if you want to. Okay, thank you very much. Um, hopefully you can hear me. So, yes, I'm Hilary Cooper. So, just to give you um, an overview of, of my career, um, I actually spent the larger part of my career in the civil service. I spent 25 years in the civil service. I went in as a, a government economist where um, I worked on labour market briefing, labour market issues and statistics. Um, after doing that for a few years, I moved into senior policy and operational roles. Um, and one of the most interesting roles I had was when I spent four years uh, as director of <laughs> HR and diversity um, in, a, in a large office in the east of England. Um, at the time, I was, or in fact, I worked out that for more than half of my career, I worked part time whilst bringing up three children um, and even as a director. Um, I was working flexibly, so lots of experience from, from that. Um, for the last five years, I've been a freelance um, consultant, and in particular, I've been an associate director um, with the think tank, the Finance Foundation, which I helped to set up. Um, we run events and publish research on the financial services sector to stimulate debate about how it can work most effectively, and um, we're quite eclectic in the, in the sort of subjects we've covered. We've, we've done re research on, on areas such as stimulating entrepreneurship, um, and I also did a very big piece of work on helping older people stay financially included um, in a digital age, um, and that, that's older people in their 80s and 90s. But earlier this year, um, I worked with the Institute on the diversity survey, which is a, a subject that I'm, I'm very committed to, um, as, as I say, and I wrote the report that, that is on, um, on the chairs that was published in, in May, um, looking at progression and pay and issues around pay transparency in, in, in the banking sector. Um, there were many positive messages to take from the survey, and it's very interesting um, that our survey also found 80% of women um, were positive about their own progression opportunities in general within the sector, although they came back and identified within their own organisations a number of barriers which men also um, you know, thought existed um, to, to some extent for them as well. Um, and despite those positive me messages, there's st clearly still a long way to go on, on female representation at, at senior levels in the sector. Um, and, you know, as we know, there's a long way to go on, on gender pay equality um, in financial services as in the economy as a whole. Um, so some of the key messages, and you can obviously pick that up from the executive summary or, or by reading the report, was a real need to give greater focus to family-friendly working practices, that, that, that without that, um, you know, that, that, that it's very hard uh, for, for women um, if they have families to progress and, and, and also um, puts a lot of strain on, on men. So everyone's got a stake in, in changing the culture in, in that respect. Um, but also the, the issues of unconscious bias, of the impact of lack of transparency, how that interacts with that and how exclusive networking 
um, can disadvantage women and how, how a whole series of cultural factors um, around role models and, and, and so on are impacting and, and um, you know, messages that, 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 that come through about um, that, you know, the need for change in those areas. Thank you, Heli. Um, <coughs> I'd like to introduce um, Emily Cox, can be, um, who is the Director of Public Affairs at Virgin Money. Emily, do you want to take us through your experience and challenges? Yes, good morning everyone. Delighted to be here. Uh, I am the Director of Public Affairs at Virgin Money and I work very closely with our Chief Executive, Jane Ann Guardia, on uh, the Women in Finance report and I continue to work very closely with the Treasury on the Women in Finance Charter. Uh, I work part-time at Virgin Money and uh, the, my current job that I have now I got uh, whilst working part-time so I think it's great to see a company that is able to promote people and give people opportunities who, uh, who aren't always working full-time. <coughs> and the other thing I would say, uh, <coughs> I think mean, I've got your cough, uh, John. <laughs> is that Virgin Money, we have set uh, gender balance targets throughout our company. Uh, so our target is 50-50 uh, with a 10% tolerance, and that's at every level. Uh, and we hope to achieve that by the end of 2020. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Um, you can probably see I'm, I'm the white man on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> I do um, a lot of events, and I'm, I'm typically the white man on the panel. Um, Actually, uh, I always count the number of men in the room um, at any diversity event, um, and uh, this mix is much better than most. Um, I'm sure we'll talk a, um, a bit about um, uh, the role that men have to play, particularly when our leaders have to play, move the agenda. Um, I have been pretty much a man boy at PwC. Um, I've been just over 30 years. Um, I'm a financial services person through and through. Um, I lead our financial services global HR consulting business. Um, and far more importantly, I lead our UK diversity and inclusion consulting business, um, helping our clients um, move the dial um, with their own challenges. Um, I was, um, I, I've been born with two huge advantages. One you can see, I'm a man, a man in business, um, in the era in which I've, uh, I've had my career has been a huge advantage. There's absolutely no question about that. I'm sure we, we talk a little bit about that. In fact, quite a lot about that. Um, secondly, uh, I was born actually in East End of London in a multicultural society. My father died when I was very young. Um, that wasn't an advantage, but my advantage is uh, my mother is a fantastic woman, uh, a huge mentor to me, um, who's uh, obsessed with education and obsessed with taking every single opportunity that arises. Um, I think those two advantages have put me in a very good position uh, to um, have a career which has been hugely fulfilling. As I get closer and closer to the end of my career, I keep looking back towards that. Um, I'm delighted to be here and uh, share, um, uh, hopefully, um, some interesting information. If you haven't picked them up, there's a number of, uh, of our reports at the back. I have the joy of leading our research and analysis in this space, um, as well as uh, um, running practice that um, helps uh, organisations in FS and beyond where their challenges are. I'm sure that we'll hopefully can share some information that's helpful to you. So, John, I'm going, to, I'm going to start off with you then on our, our first question. So, give us an overview of what the gender pay gap currently looks like and your insight into the underlying issues causing current gap. Yeah, it's, um, I will do that, absolutely, of course. Um, I'm hopeful that we do talk a little bit about uh, wider diversity issues, uh, not just uh, on, on gender. I mean, it was great to see um, the base select committee recommend um, to the government, and it will be accepted. Uh, that um, both uh, Bain pay gap reporting and disability pay gap reporting should come in by 2020. Um, and there's no doubt that will be accepted um, and almost certainly be extended over the coming years to LGBT plus and social mobility as well. Um, I think it's really important to say things how they are, the good and the bad and the ugly. On the gender pay gap, financial services is terrible, full stop. The average gender pay gap in the UK is pretty poor, 14%, and financial services more than twice that, at 30%. Mm -hmm. In banking, it's 35%. The bonus pay gap is even worse. The bonus pay gap across financial services is 60%. 
bankers are quite as bad as asset management firms. Those numbers will get worse this year. And they'll get even worse when the extensions Gen Bank Act reporting is going to be reduced from 250 employee threshold entities to 50. And the reason for that is that will bring in a whole swathe of the alternative industry, and including partners in the gender pay gap, will increase the number significantly, particularly across the private equity businesses in the alternative industry. The other reason, of course, is that last year, generally has been a pretty good year for national services, uh, particularly investment savers and insurance. Um, and when you have demographics, where 90% of the top earners are men, and there's more money to pay, clearly more of that's going to the men. So the gaps are going to get worse in year two, and I'm sure we spend a little bit of time talking about the reputation issues and management of those issues. So there's no doubt, as Wimper said, that significant progress has been made, but there's an awful long way to go, not just on gender. So, Emily, I'm hoping you can give some better news about certainly about Virgin Money and your expertise and the sort of underlying issues that, that you've seen there. How you've So, I completely agree with John. Uh, I think the gender pay gap is completely unacceptable, and at Virgin Money, it's much higher than we'd like it to be. It started at uh, 36% uh, three years ago. We've just reported our third year of gender pay gap reporting, and we've seen uh, our third 10% uh, reduction in our, in our gap. And the reason that we're managing to achieve that, I think it's twofold. I, mean, I think the, the gender pay gap reporting, as much as we can all complain about the way in which the statistics work, what it's done, actually, is to really make uh, the issues in this area a brand issue and it's something which now is regularly talked about at both our exco level and also uh, by our board and it's something which we take really seriously and because it's a very public measure you have to get into the reasons and the analysis behind what's causing your gap and whilst uh, when we looked at it, uh, we've got the obvious problem that everybody else has got uh, in terms of not enough senior women uh, in the top jobs. Equally, uh, when we looked at the distribution of people across our business, the uh, customer facing roles are 75% dominated by part time women. And if you buy into all of the um, business arguments uh, as to why a more diverse workforce is better for business, which we do, then why wouldn't you look at gender parity across every level of your business? So for us, half of our gap is created by the fact that uh, most of our customer-facing people are women. And when we got into that, uh, what we found is our brand is equally attracted to men and women. Uh, but when uh, we do blind recruitment, but when we got to the decision-making element where we put people in, we actually had a bias against uh, men, and particularly young men. And we've had to work very hard uh, at overcoming that. But we can see by getting to that sort of gender balance at every level, we will almost eliminate uh, our gender pay gap. The second uh, thing that we've done that's had real traction in our business is looking at what we do at our end of year uh, pay and bonus cycle and like every other business after the event we've always looked at uh, the pay analysis and bonus distribution by every um, uh, diversity strand that you can think of and it was always really interesting but we didn't actually do anything with it because it was after the event so our reward team created, it's a really simple spreadsheet. Uh, every uh, exec member in our business uh, has a target, um, <coughs> written into their objectives about their gender pay gap. They know what it is by functional area. And when I, as a people manager, make decisions for my team, my spreadsheet tells me live what that's doing to our gender pay gap in our area. And the reason I think that's really different is it stops the HR team being a policing function and coming along and challenging management decisions after the event. 
And all it's doing really is making you confront your own analysis. Uh, equally, it tells me what I'm doing, men versus women, and also importantly, part-time versus full-time decisions. So bonus and pay increases. And we have analysis in our business which shows it makes people question their own decisions and uh, actually sometimes change them. Now actually, it might be right in your team that that year only the men get the bonuses, but at least you've had to think about it and justify that to yourself. And as I say, because it's done live, that makes a significant difference. Uh, and I, I think simple things like that, that just nudge things in the right direction, are really super helpful. Yeah, no, that's, that's really good. I suppose that <coughs> covers the conscious bias element as well, which we're going to go into. Helen, have you got anything really from the members, so the individuals that, that face um, the, the gender pay gap? Was there anything that came out particularly in the report? I mean, I think the key issue, and, and you've alluded to it, I mean, very helpfully saying it's, it's the underrepresentation of men um, in more junior positions, but it, uh, it's also the underrepresentation of women in senior positions. And I think, therefore, again, it, it comes back to, you know, what are the barriers? You, you know, you, you have, you have women coming in at the start in senior positions and then if the attrition as you get more and more senior is, is, is very apparent and that comes back to these issues of, you know, are women um, not progressing or not pushing for higher pay in the same way that men do because they have requirements around flexible working that, that, that you know, they want to, they might bargain on um, flexibility more than they might bargain on pay, um, and there's some evidence um, on, on that in the survey. But you know, the, these are the sort of less tangible barriers about um, unconscious bias and, and attitudes and so on, which we yeah. might come on to. Yeah, actually, that would be helpful. Just moving moving on to the sort of the question about unconscious bias, because that's um, that is often cited as, as a key barrier. Um, What's your thoughts on that? The sort of solutions? Yeah, um, and it's very interesting. Our, so our survey um, showed that both men and women thought unconscious bias was an issue that needed addressing in relation to women. Um, 28% of men said that and 42% of women said that. So a lot of these questions, although we report the average, um, women were much more sensitised and, and or believed because we, don't, we obviously don't know it the actual truth, but the perception and belief was much stronger in women that these things affected them. And they also, women were also very clear that they felt that some senior, um, and they did say male managers, um, had negative attitudes, whether those were explicit or implicit. Um, in terms of what to do about it, um, there, are, there is some research that said, uh, you know, what, one of the, the, the sort of responses, and you know, just know, um, what, what Emma thinks about this, one of the responses is to say, oh, we'll do unconscious bias training, um, we'll do mandatory diversity training. There's some evidence that that may not be effective, and in some cases, particularly where you make it mandatory, it may even sort of engender some negative attitudes. So um, the, the other, other researchers sort of said, well, um, let, let's come in and, and tackle processes and activities um, where un unconscious bias might be having an impact. And obviously the, the spreadsheet is a, is a very mm. clear and classic example of doing that very innovative way. Um, but, you know, you can also just take it back to real basics. So looking at how unconscious bias might affect your recruitment and your promotion. Mm. Um, you know, are people running structured interviews when they recruit where everybody's asked the same questions? Are they assessing people against pre-decided objective criteria rather than this sort of fitting the job to the person rather than the person to the job? So all, all these ways in which unconscious bias can come in. Even some evidence that asking people um, who you might recruit to perform tasks that are relevant to the role rather than basing it all on performance of the interview. Um, can help overcome con unconscious bias and, and actually relate more to the skills that, that you need in the role. And I think um, the same thing comes to promotion. Um, <coughs> that, that may 
that may be partly unconscious bias affecting women's promotion opportunities, but there's also evidence that women tend to put themselves forward less for promotion, perhaps because they feel discouraged or, or for whatever reasons. Um, and so, you know, are there processes that you can introduce that, that might um, pick up women who've been in a role for a particular number of years and encourage them to think about their their promotion um, or where you can, instead of promoting people into a specific role, take people in batches and assess them against a standard and sort of identify who's ready for promotion. So I think the message is try and build in processes that minimise how unconscious biases can, can impact on outcomes. Which, which I think leads on, lead really on to your, your point. Emily, have you got anything that you want to add to that? Uh, I suppose I just think that people can get really aerated about whether or not uh, unconscious mass training works or not. And I think it's like any other type of training. If you just put people through one sheep dip process and hope for the best, and that that's somehow going to change behaviour and attitudes in any walk of life, then clearly I think that's not going to work. But if you do unconscious bias training as part of a wider programme of initiatives to actually tackle issues within your organisation, then actually I think it's really helpful. Equally, I think the organisational stories and what I call those moments of truth are really important because I think the issue around unconscious bias training is that perhaps uh, we might assume that it just uncovers biases against women. But actually it doesn't. I mean, in our organisation, as I say, in particular in those customer facing roles, it uncovered a, a, a very actually conscious bias against men. And that led to a very healthy debate about uh, what do we mean in terms of good customer service. And if Virgin Atlantic can find outstanding cabin crew who are men and women, why are Virgin Money struggling to put men into our stores? And actually, it turned out that some of the uh, dinosaurs in our organisation believe that women are better at uh, customer <coughs> service than men. Uh, having uh, wanted to punch them all on several occasions, uh, we have actually got to uh, a better outcome on that because you can, you can actually demonstrate that that's actually not right. And if you are a customer-facing organisation, and half the population will be men, half are women, then why wouldn't you want your customer-facing people to reflect not just you know, the demographics that we've got, but the communities uh, that we're in? And I think, you know, of course, that's better, um, better for business. Thank you, Emily. John, I suppose, so not the, not the sole solution, definitely not. So what are the other, the other sort of options and solutions that organisations have or that you've seen successfully used even? So um, if I could just say something quickly on unconscious bias um, uh, in generality. Uh, <coughs> um, our, our head of internal head of diversity inclusion here is a famous woman called Sarah Churchman. Um, has been in that role for about 15 years. And uh, she's a very amusing woman. And um, she said, uh, we've had mandatory unconscious bias training across our 20 odd thousand staff uh, for 12 years. Previously. And she said, when we first put that in, it put us back four years or so. Because the board said, unconscious bias training, we've done that, tick, move on to the next subject. Um, however, I 100% agree with Emily. Um, I think unconscious bias training has a fantastic place to play to raise awareness. Um, but it does not fix the issues. It's an awareness raiser, and it therefore needs to be part of an overall awareness campaign and an overall focus on moving the dial. So I think that's really important. Um, unconscious bias, I, I had the joy of going before the Church Select Committee and being grilled for two hours um, on the Inquiry Women Finance Charter. Um, and one of the, um, one of the challenges uh, that was thrown at me is that uh, you're using unconscious bias as just a euphemism for discrimination. Um, and I don't use it as euphemism for discrimination. Um, and as we know, um, it's been unlawful to discriminate on, on the basis of pretty much every diverse dimension uh, since the 1970s. Um, that's not to say that there isn't some discrimination um, that still continues, but it's um, very much uh, uh, an exceptional case uh, rather than the norm. Um, however, having said that, it's really, really important to understand where 
individuals' blind spots, biases are, and what difference they make. And the critical thing for me is that the vast majority of organisations do not have the data to understand that. And I actually find that quite amusing in financial services um, because we're obsessed with data. No business decision gets made in financial services. Well, now, not only not having the data, but once you've got the data, analysing it 32 different ways and then discussing it you know, with 16 different people with different views, or rather 16 people who look like me with the same view. So it's actually fairly amusing that when it comes to an important business issue like where are our decisions that are being made that are not equal, whether that's on recruitment, pay and rations, promotion decisions, opportunities on projects, learning and development, whatever it might be, we need the data. And those organisations, including Virgin Money and including PwC, who spend time really focusing on analysing information in their businesses, analysing, for example, on promotions, whether someone in the same role, whether they're less same man or woman, who are rated the same with the same level of tenure, the same level of experience, does the woman take longer to be promoted than the man? That's actually important to understand, rather than just assume what the situation may be. So the data is really, really important and then focus the energies around those biases and the areas which actually make a big difference in the business. And they do vary, there's no doubt. I've been doing a fantastic piece of work with um, a Japanese investment bank over the last two years. Um, and I always say that because if you can make changes happen in Japanese investment banks, stereotypes in that organisation is true. You can make them happen anywhere. And what was amusing is that organisation had a whole bunch of initiatives and a lot of those were in the recruitment area. You will not be surprised to know that, that they've been recruiting significantly less people now than they used to. In an organisation of 4,500 people, they only recruit 70 people, middle manager and upwards. Now, a bit crass comment, but I don't care what happens in the recruitment, I do care. But I much prefer to actually deal with the issues that make the biggest difference in the organisation, which is not recruitment in that organisation. So I, I think data is really, really, really important to understand. Um, and focus the efforts on the areas that really, really matter. Um, and yeah, I'm conscious I haven't answered your question, so I'm really quick because I've taken too much time. I would say I actually agree hugely with Emily said. I think um, my view is around interventions and challenges in those very specific pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that make the difference. So it's not just recruitment, there are at least 15 parts of the recruitment process. Which pieces of those recruitment parts of the recruitment process actually does the data tell you that there are likely to be biases in those decisions? <laughs> and focus on those pieces of that jigsaw puzzle. Um, yes, you've got to get the HR policies right. Yes, you've got to get the processes right. But the biggest difference is actually having real time interventions and challenges, like what now will be Emily's famous spreadsheets. Real challenges and interventions, not just tools, but challenges, challenges with ourselves challenging ourselves and other people challenging ourselves as well, at those moments where you know from the data that interventions will make a difference. I think that's, that's a really good point um, around the recruitment because I think that is reflective of where we see the professional body. So at the entry level qualifications, um, you have got wide diversity. You know, the, the stats look absolutely incredible. But then as people progress through their careers, they di people disappear. So where have, they, where have the people gone? Um, because you don't have that support through individuals' career that means that that diversity continues throughout their career. I mean, we've got um, a situation when it comes to becoming a chartered banker where it, it's down to 30, almost 30%. Um, and actually getting to fellows is, is even less than that. Um, and uh, so I think there's there's so much work to be done with what happens all the way through. And that leads me on to actually the next point, John, and I'd actually like to come back to you on this, which is about how important then is that point in your career when it's the returners programme. So um, how important do you think the returner programmes are in bringing experienced women back? Um, to middle and senior management roles, and then I think Emily will be able to give us maybe her, uh, her experience in that, but I'd like to hear from you particularly on that. Uh, so let me just, uh, you can probably tell I'm a numbers person, and I should apologise because every single number I give you is slightly wrong, but they're directionally correct, I promise, I'm old, so I forget my numbers. Um, 
Um, so here's the number. Over 140,000 in financial and professional services, individuals, over 90% of those being women, wish to return into business. Over 140,000. Astonishing number. Mm-hmm. So how important is it to get a large chunk of those, even a tiny chunk of those, men and women, but vast majority of women, back into business? Hugely important, because there's a huge amount of talent. Um, there's, um, I'm quite depressed, actually, um, around um, what's happening on Turner's. Um, I'm massively proud of lots of things PwC does, mm-hmm. and I'm very proud of our returns program. It's one of five areas that we've identified where we need to improve significantly, where we put a big focus. We have a returns program, um, which actually brings, and, and today actually, I think I think every one of the returns has been women, but it's not open only to women, uh, back into our business. Um, but the numbers are tiny. The numbers are tiny. The biggest returns program I know in banking is 120 people returned last year, which is one of the big UK banks. So the, the numbers are tiny, which I think is both a little bit depressing, but also I think is a huge opportunity. Um, and there are a number of different barriers, um, perceived barriers in returns, which is quite interesting. Uh, so I do some work on terms of progress for, for organisations, and, and almost, certain, almost um, consistently one of the key challenges is, um, well, we don't want a different bar for the returners as we have for anybody else. So we're going to use the same set of criteria to see whether someone can come up and open the business or not. Um, and I, my first reaction to that is, why? Right, so you might as well just say, we're going to disadvantage every single returner. Uh, because one of the common complaints, so-called, is that um, returners are not up to date on all of what's gone on in, say, banking. Um, they, um, they haven't had experience over the last five years or two years, whatever it's been, with being out in business. They haven't had experience of working in your business. They've had huge experience. A number of you, I suspect, are fathers and mothers in the room. The skills that you develop caring for your children and bringing them up, that's pretty valuable in the business context. But look at any job description. It would be very difficult to find where those skills come in because they need to be re-looked at. The criteria need to be re-looked at. We look at bringing someone into that job there, but that job there actually isn't as flexible as it needs to be to actually be helpful for return to come in because we need to redefine it. So there's quite a lot of work that needs to be done. There's a huge amount of good intention by a number of major organisations and a number of smaller organisations <coughs> on returns programmes. Um, but I, I think there's still an awful long way that I need to go. There's a huge opportunity, and it's not just about bringing women back into middle and senior management roles, it's bringing talent back into business. There's a huge opportunity. And the scarcity of talent remains every single year. We've been doing a CEO survey globally now for I think it's 21 years. Every year, scarcity of talent is one of the top 10 issues for CEOs. And this is a huge talent pool that is not being tapped as sufficient as it should be. So I'm, I'm massively positive, but also I want to kick businesses, including PwC. I'm delighted to say that you know, we've now, after four years, we've recognised it needs to be one of our big priorities, and, and work's been done on that, to really progress and look at this in, in a realistic and sensible way. Emily, Virgin, so how is this, how is this an area that you're tackling at Virgin Money? Well, again, we, uh, we have the same uh, issues as everybody else, which is broadly, um, you, know, you can sort of see the distribution of people and gender as some sort of large pyramid. So, uh, you know, broadly equal men and women uh, in our entry level jobs and graduate recruitment. But uh, as women hit their early 30s, that's where we started to lose ours. Uh, and I do think that returner programs have a part to play. Uh, we started our first one last year. We're headquartered up in the northeast, and uh, one of the issues that we find is if you go out looking for people with financial services expertise, and it really constrains uh, the talent pool. And actually, for lots of jobs in our business, you don't need FS experience. Uh, and once we took that away, uh, actually some of the talent that we found out there was incredible. You know, people with first class degrees that 
had had careers in oil and gas, uh, people who'd worked uh, you know, very high up uh, in uh, marketing for many you know, those sorts of people are just sort of floating around our region looking for opportunities. I agree with what John says in that our returner program is open to men and women, uh, and uh, very consciously so. Um, and the, yeah, the other thing I would say is we do it on the basis of a 12-week program. There's no guarantee of a job at the end, but that 12 weeks is about building confidence and uh, helping people uh, get used to being in the workplace again. And of course, you need to be able to offer that on a flexible basis because uh, lots of people will have either young kids or maybe caring responsibilities uh, which you have to acknowledge uh, as a business. And for us, that has been uh, really successful. I just wanted to pick up um, uh, sort of a couple of other points that you were making, uh, Joanne, about sort of hiring women, particularly um, you know, from that middle management layer uh, upwards. Uh, two things. I think that uh, in terms of flexible or agile working, it's far easier to negotiate that if you're in a job it's almost impossible to get those sorts of jobs um, uh, if you're an external candidate. And uh, one of the things that we found is actually been super successful uh, was we found that we were long-listing uh, great candidates and we would quite often lose the women, the senior women, uh, before the shortlisting stage because they rule themselves out. And uh, when we conducted our analysis, uh, what we found is the reason that they are less likely to move, even if you're offering more money, is because they really value the working relationships they have with their current employer, and they're worth their weight in gold, both informal and formal flexible working. So uh, for certain roles, we will proactively offer to match people's current working arrangements. We put that out on LinkedIn. It is the most liked article, or anything that we've ever put up. And uh, we found it uh, a really successful way, actually, of bringing quite senior women into our organization because our view is if your working pattern works in another business, why on earth couldn't we make it work uh, in ours? The final point I wanted to make is that I think headhunters have a really important part to play uh, in all of this. Uh, and we've written into our terms and conditions with headhunters that we want to see balanced shortlists and diverse candidates. It is often almost impossible to get them to do that because they will consistently tell you that the talent isn't out there. Now, I think one of the issues in all of that is uh, if headhunters go out to, to men, a couple of calls, they're more likely to put themselves forward. With women, it takes a lot longer. So I think you have to, speed of hiring at that senior end makes a difference. You have to be prepared to wait to get the right, um, the right candidates. Uh, and equally, you have to force the issue with the headhunters. So we were hiring a, a director of um, facilities, again, up in the northeast, uh, asking to see uh, balanced shortlists, headhunters providing time and time again all male shortlists. And uh, our chief operating officer, who, by the way, has a double link to his pay in terms of uh, hiring uh, a balanced, gender balanced number of people, just said, look, this is totally unacceptable. And he went away and he Googled, you know, women in facilities. And he went back to the headhunters and said, I, I can see in five minutes that there are at least three women who've won national awards for their work in facilities. Can you explain to me why they're not on my shortlist? And I think, as I say, forcing those issues uh, does make a difference. Um, now, that's not to say that we will hire women over men. Absolutely not. We are all about taking the best person for the team. Uh, and recently, with our um, audit director, we would have loved to have hired a senior woman, and we tried really, really hard. But at the end of the day, you know, the guy was the best candidate, and he's the guy who got the job. But we are satisfied 
that we have looked at all the talent that, are, that is out there. And I think, you know, as long as you can do that uh, and you know that you're taking the time to do things properly, uh, I do think over time we will see both uh, gender distribution significantly changing and the gender pay gap coming down. Can I add a statistic? Because I'm on my stats. Yeah. Just doing what Henry's saying. Um, uh, it's, uh, uh, you, ha you have to ask a woman eight times if they're interested in talking about a role. And you have to ask a man 1.4 times. <laughs> um, and, um, and there's lots of you know, good reasons for that. It's one of those stereotypes is absolutely true. Uh, you know, a man's done a particular role for two and a half weeks and thinks he's an absolute world expert. The woman's done it for 14 years and is still worrying about two things he did wrong two years ago. And um, I'm an exaggerating, but that is, is right. And I think there's, um, uh, I, I totally underline what, what Danny's saying around uh, headhunters. I think businesses let their headhunters off the hook. Um, you know, um, I see one of my colleagues at the back who leads our risk and regulatory business and financial services. Um, and we've done some really innovative things in that business um, in, in, in terms of uh, ensuring that we're bringing in our recruitment um, more um, diverse candidates, which is not just about women. But one of the things we, we said is that we recognize it's harder, about four to five times harder as a headhunter um, to actually get particularly senior experienced women interested in a role. But we recognize that. So we pay you more, right? We give you more time. And by the way, you still don't get out with it, then we won't use you ever again. Now, I, know, I think that is one of, the, one of the examples of the interventions, They're just intervening with your suppliers on these things, which I think is really, really important. Very important. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think you, you brought out a point, Hilly, I'm even bringing you in here, mm -hmm. because with the membership research, particularly, there was quite a difference in individual responses actually between the genders when it came to confidence and ownability and go for the next role actually. Absolutely. Absolutely, yes, and and you know, this comes through again and again in, in, in studies that and so um I think it was in relation to um, the question about what are the barriers to progression, and some of them were organisational barriers, but then people were bringing up personal barriers and lack of confidence, um, feeling they don't fit in, and feeling they need more training was something that women were much more likely to raise than men, and objectively probably not the case, but it's about self-perception. Um, just on the issue of returners, um, and obviously I'm, I'm not an expert because I don't work directly in the sector, but I did used to work in the civil service. Um, so I think the discussion has been about bringing people back into your business who might be out there in the wider world. But one of the things we focused on in the civil service was um, bringing back our own people who may have been away from the workplace and we had a, an extensive career break scheme, which I <coughs> myself made use of. Um, but when I was managing staff and, and HR director, we did put quite a lot of focus on um, keep in touch schemes for people who were away, including people who were away for two or three years, um, sort of an annual come back into work um, for, for, for a week, be updated on the systems, get a briefing from the people about what's going on in the organisation. Um, and we, we also, um, which I think made a huge difference, paid for people's childcare to come in and do that. So it's you know, not just their travel costs, but we recognised that if we were bringing them back in for, for a week to be updated, that there was a cost to them that, that in, they weren't in paid employment. So I think, I think there are sort of things that you can do with your own staff to sort of minimise the attrition yeah. and keep them in touch, as well as once they get back, you know, being sensitive to their potential needs for flexibility, advertising, jobs as flexible by default and so on. So I think there's a lot of stuff you can put in there. Just, just actually on a final point, Emily, because I, I think I'd like to bring you in here about the Virgin Money Returner Programme, because it's not just about that returner element. So I think you do something unique with them once they're back in the, once people are back in the business. So it, it, you sort of keep in touch with them and you check in with them well, like a year or two years later, is that right? Uh, I think you might mean the uh, maternity mentoring yes. program, uh, yeah. which again uh, is open to men and women because we have uh, lots of men taking shared parental uh, leave. About 60% of our dads last year took fully paid shared parental leave, which actually, by the way, is game changing for everybody because uh, it starts to make supporting 
working families full stop um, uh, a point that you can uh, reiterate in your workforce but uh, the mentoring scheme is open to both men and women um, the men are taking shared parental leave but for women in particular and I must mentor about seven or eight uh, colleagues the way it works is as soon as we know that you're going to go off you're offered the opportunity to be uh, mentored by a business person the person who uh, is either pregnant or going on shared parental leave gets to choose who that person is. Um, and uh, I meet with my people when they're pregnant, when they're off, if that's what they want to do. But I think the most important thing is the two to three years after they return from maternity leave. Because I think so often, and I experienced it myself uh, when I had my daughter three years ago, is you come back to the workplace and people treat you as you were before you had a child and they totally don't uh, factor into the conversations that your brain no longer works and uh, you are sleep deprived and you might not be able to find your work trousers uh, in the chaos of your home life. So, um, but the, in the people that I mentor, what I think is really important is giving them space to think and just to work through issues and actually to talk to someone who understands what it's like and has been there. Um, and I think so often in the people that I talk to, there is this real, uh, it's not a desire, but they, they feel compelled to be superwoman. You know, they've got to be an amazing mother they feel that they've got to be 110% committed to their career, but often they're trying to move house and do all sorts of other things as well. And actually, I think listening to someone and, as I say, just giving them the time to work through a few things, think about things that uh, they might be worrying about completely unnecessarily is actually a really simple intervention that just works uh, and uh, again, I think it, it's just something which is uh, super successful. And we have both men and women who volunteer to be uh, mentors. And then it's, you know, as I say, it's, there's a selection process, and that just works well for us. It's interesting, Emily. Um, quite often, my brain doesn't work, um, and I can't find my trousers. <laughs> <laughs> that might be for different reasons. I think it might be for different reasons. But uh, 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 seriously, um, how you just described, uh, which is great, um, if you took out um, uh, the mentoring is uh, for uh, women um, and these men on shared parental leave, um, and we, we uh, apply that to everybody, wouldn't that be a massive improvement in life? Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, across across uh, banking and financial services, particularly good actually having sponsorship and mentoring programs uh, for you know that 0.5 percent of our staff who've been identified truly talented, and uh, the 99.5 percent of staff are just okay, um, which of course is nonsense. And I think there's a um, yeah, back to my point around understanding where uh, what the data tells us where the biases are. Quite often, in, um, particularly across banking, that's around um, that three to five year period in middle management, and for men and women, by the way, but particularly for women because it also coincides very often on the age in which women have their first child. Um, um, and the various interventions that can happen at that point in time, I think mentoring actually plays a very important part of that, um, not least because it shows not just understanding but care, which is uh, incredibly important. Thanks for that. You gave me a flashback, or a little flashback actually, for when I came back from maternity leave and I had to go on this leadership away day and they asked us, um, I couldn't really think at the time, I had two under two, and um, they asked a question about what you felt most proud of and the only thing I could think of at that point was that I'd made cupcakes the previous Saturday in the morning with my children. That was the only thing that came to mind at that point. Was um, I couldn't remember anything previous to yeah. that. That had um, just the effort that I came in from work and got up first thing on a Saturday morning. So um, it's the simple things in life, really. Um, just moving back to the, the sort of the pay gap, actually, Hilary, I'm going to come back to you because one of the areas that I'd like us to explore is the transparency question and I think John I'm going to bring you in because I want to go further than just about pay and bonus transparency but um, in the research that we did certainly um, 
the the significant barriers to equality, if you like, was round about the transparency around how pay and bonus awards were actually made. Um, Helene, what sort of what are people telling us that are the culture change that's required to sort of address this barrier more fully? Thanks. So I'll just recap on, on what we found in, in the survey. Um, so a third of respondents in the survey said that there was a, a low level of transparency about what other people are earning in their organisation in similar jobs and about how pay, pay rises are determined. And that went up to 46% saying there was a low level of transparency around how and why bonuses were awarded. Um, so that that's that is important because although a lot of people said yes, we have we have pay ranges, we know what the rate for the job is, um, we have a performance appraisal system, and we know how our salary rises are, are linked to performance. They were also saying yes, but there is some scope for negotiation. We don't sort of know you know, why some people, or, or even whether some people are getting more benefit out of that system or not, because there isn't enough transparency. Um, and so, what, you know, the, the, the message that was coming out that, yes, there is discre discretion in pay negotiation um, around what salary you get and how that gets increased, um, came through in, in a very significant finding when we asked people um, whether they felt that there were some residual gender pay gaps. I mean, most people said, yes, 67% of people said they were very confident that people doing the same job to the same standard would be paid the same. But when, when we asked, so where that isn't the case, what, what do you think is a key reason? And the biggest reason was that women were put at a disadvantage in negotiating because they didn't have anything... Um, they didn't know what their target was because they didn't. There wasn't enough transparency, um, so they didn't know what they could or should be asking for. Um, and clearly, why that disadvantage is women and not men. So men also don't know um, what other people are earning. But clearly, there's some cultural factor that means that um, men benefit from that and women are disadvantaged from that. If if that finding is is um, you know, generalised. So in terms of culture changes, you know, obviously lack of transparency is a culture of, of, of secrecy and, and, and a form of exclusion of people from information that, that, that they ought to know. And it, and it also means that you, it, it, it facilitates a culture where subjective factors can, can influence decisions um, because nobody can challenge it because they don't have the information to challenge it. So. Um, clearly, if you if you if you say okay, we're not we're not going to do that. We want to commit to a culture where transparency is key, where everybody does have that information, and and you know, and we believe that it's objective criteria, it's people's skills and and, and experience are the, are, the, are the only things, not how well they negotiate or who they go to the pub with or all the rest of it. So it's that sort of saying we need fair and objective criteria in a transparent mm -hmm. environment is a, is a really key thing. But the second cultural change is to recognise that, um, you know, that, that something has been stopping women successfully negotiating over pay and pay rises and there's a lot of stuff being written about, you know, why women aren't able to push um, or, or don't, you know, don't feel, feel as empowered to, to push for, for pay in the same way that perhaps um, men do. It may be due, due to this lack of transparency. It may be to do with, um, the, you know, the fact that they value flexibility much more than um, pay rises. So they might bargain over being able to um, you know, say, look, I do my job really well, can I go down to four days a week rather than I do my job really well, can I have a 20% pay rise? Um, so th there's all those issues that need to be addressed. Those, those are other cultural issues. Um, why shouldn't I, I be able to go down to four days a week and have a pro rata 10% pay rise if I'm doing my job that well, um, rather than seeing them, them as a trade-off? So I think it's about making clear at recruitment and at review stages that pay is negotiable, that supporting women through perhaps mentoring and, and um, sponsorship to, to think about how they negotiate and to tackle um, 
negative views towards women, there's some evidence that organisations are more positive towards men than they are towards women um, when they push for higher pay. Not sure why that might be the case, but there is some evidence. So trying to tackle, again, that's part of the sort of unconscious bias. There's been a lot in the press recently and sort of more generally in the literature, particularly in America, actually, about whether um, previous salary as, as an embedded culture um, is something that, that we now need to rethink and perhaps ditch because it's quite clear from all the evidence that if, if um, you hire somebody and base their salary on their previous salary, that is embedding historic gender pay gaps. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, what is the reason for, for using previous salary? How can that lead to um, equality of pay if, if someone comes in on a higher salary than me doing the same job? just because that was their previous salary. So it raises a lot of sort of questions yeah. in any case about um, pay practices. Um, and salary should be based on, on what, what people's skills are worth. Um, so I think, you know, this comes back to leadership, to people really um, at the top of an organisation, tackling these sorts of cultural barriers, committing to job evaluations, committing to equal pay audits, to just check that you know there are no historic anomalies that have arisen from mm -hmm. these sort of historic cultural practices. And I think it is quite interesting and be interesting to hear other people's view. I think that the gender pay reporting exercise, at the time of it, um, I don't want to use the word panic, but I think it did make some organisations have a very um, quick look <laughs> at um, how you know whether all the jobs were sort of actually conforming to. Um, uh, pay equality requirements, um, but also, you know, good organisations uh, um, sort of preparing their narrative and kind of saying, yes, we do need to have regular, you know, equality audits and so on. So I think there's an awful lot that, that can change in the culture. Thanks. For, thank you for that, Hilary. John, I would quite like to bring you in because your most recent piece of research, there's more of the hidden barriers there and there's definitely more on the cultural side when it relates to beyond the pain bonus, but the environment that people work in. Um, could you can maybe come in on that a bit more? Sure. Um, I can't resist saying something quickly though from what Lewis said. I think that um, I'm, I'm a big fan of what I call appropriate transparency. Um, um, I'm, uh, I'm not a fan of prescriptive transparency. Um, I think it's important for an organisation to be clear about what it needs to be appropriate about. So, for example, I think it's actually really important to be clear about uh, what uh, what a success looks like in every role and what um, what the, um, uh, the pay bands are for those roles, um, and indeed what the processes and decisions uh, process will be made to determine pay uh, bonuses. Um, I'm not a fan in publishing everyone's pay for example, um, although PwC, um, we have 900 parts of PwC and we're open with each other about exactly what we're going to get paid, um, which is quite interesting. I'm looking at Philippa, uh, we probably spend half a day a year grabbing and groaning about the fact that that part gets paid more than me, and that's it, and it's just an interest. Um, but I think it's really important, I agree with you entirely, it's really important uh, for everyone to understand what do they need to do and how are decisions made, I think it's important. To your, to your uh, the direct question you asked me, um, and our latest research, and do pick it up at the back, um, um, and uh, I preface this by saying it's taken me three months to get this through our legal department to, before I published it, so you can sort of understand uh, what I'm about to say. The latest research shows uh, that instances of sexual harassment and bullying in financial services are significantly higher than any other sector. Um, over 25% uh, of women um, uh, experience uh, some degree of uh, sexual harassment um, and a higher number of men and women um, experience uh, bullying. Um, now your definition and my definition of what is sexual harassment and what is bullying will be different, um, which is important. But there's a really important part here of uh, what I call casual sexism and casual bullying. You know, those. Um, those so-called bantering and amusing remarks uh, that happen every day, um, which uh, particularly women um, uh, feel in, uh, cumulatively is actually really not a good place to be. Um, and I think it's really important that uh, the industry understands these issues 
and addresses the issues. This is very largely not a legal issue. This is not about sexual harassment in a legal sense. Uh, but understand that, that, that um, creating an environment where everyone feels um, that uh, they can both be themselves um, without um, being undermined um, by uh, various comments and actions, largely but not exclusively by more senior men. Um, is, is very important for you to, to accept. Without dealing with those issues, um, uh, then actually you can have all the transparency in the world, um, but actually it won't be believed, and it doesn't matter if it is believed, it's not a place I want to work. Um, so that's really critical. Oh, by the way, the numbers are really high across all industries, it's just they are significantly higher in financial services uh, than uh, in other industries, which is a little frightening. Thanks for that, John. Amy, just want to bring you in. Well, I was going to say, you know, a 60% gender bonus gap, I mean, that's completely unacceptable. And I think that, you know, the, the whole point about the gender pay gap reporting is, it's very public and women know about it and women are looking at those statistics and they'll start to make some choices about who they want to work for. I was at a bank yesterday with some senior women who were talking about their, their bonus gap and how unfair it is. Now, I think transparency is really important and I think the, um, the narrative uh, and, and the actions that uh, banks and other financial services companies are taking to close their gap are going to have increasing importance because you can start to look at the direction of travel of your employer and you can start to compare yourself within sector and within competing businesses. And if you are a senior woman who is looking, uh, looking for fairness, who you're looking for equality and you're looking for parity, why on earth would you want to work for a company that isn't taking this sort of stuff seriously and doing something about it? That's just what I wanted to say. Oh, well, you've got another snap. Oh, thank you. I've got another snap. Um, so when you ask uh, millennials, and I don't know, two-thirds plus of this room is made up of millennials, you and I are the same generation, generally, so it's nice to look at you, so. 85% um, um, of millennials, men and women, on the top three things to look at before they even consider a particular employer, is the diversity of that business. 85%. If an organization doesn't understand that, doesn't understand that in, not only in terms of how it's portraying itself, and the gender pay gap is part of that, but it's much wider than that. Of course, it's all about, as you say, what you're trying to do to improve things. Um, then it's missing a huge trick. Well, one of the things that we do, which I find um, is part of our client quite new, and I'm looking at Jack because he hates doing this in his team, is that we look at the reputation of organisations. We assess an organisation's reputation of diversity and inclusion. Um, and we look at 17 different areas and we look at all public available information, absolutely everything. Um, and um, it really surprises me how few organisations, including most of those organisations who have got a really good reputation, actually have got specifically looking at portraying that in the recruitment process, which I find you know, quite amusing. Um, a depressing statistic, not surprising, 85% of millennials say we're looking at diversity and inclusion in organisation, we want to consider it. When you ask an individual in their first year of employment in an organisation, so it could be, you know, they've, you know, they've worked in seven organisations, but the first year of employment in that organisation, whether they think that organisation has a level playing field in terms of pay and rations and opportunities and projects, etc. 15, 1-5% say no, which is not surprising in the 85%. The scary number is that doubles once they've been in, 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 within an organisation for five years plus. What organisations say and what they do are not the same. Over 70% of people say, in financial services, say that their company is not delivering on their promises on diversity and inclusion. But the numbers are really, really important, I think. You know, Emily's point about 60% bonus gap is entirely correct. But there's a really important, however, let's go out of bank because I haven't got the banking numbers in my head. When you've got in investment management, slightly more than 10% of portfolio managers 
who are by far the highest earned people in that organisation are women, and the highest bonuses are paid to fund managers, is a shock. You have a huge bonus gap. It's a reflection of the demographics. Now, I can say that because I've done a lot of work and actually look into the numbers to see does a woman who's rated the same have the same proportion of uh, a potential bonus? And in often cases, that is not true. No is the answer. But in many businesses, the answer is yes. It is true. And it's, it's a reflection of the demographics. Um, and the industry is going to be suffering these issues for a long time. It takes about 12 years from someone coming into investments to become a fund manager. This is a generational issue that we're going to be coping with as an industry, very significant gender pay gaps. And by the way, very significant bank pay gaps. And by the way, huge disability pay gaps. Yeah, we're going to be suffering these for a very long time. So the whole transparency issue and reputation management, I think, is absolutely critical. Otherwise, nobody would want to work in the business. Well, that's, a, that's a really good point. And I actually think you've answered the last question a wee bit there as well, which, which was really about... Um, you know, what can firms do to really turn up the dial? So I think that's that's great, which is about that, that reputation management, but doing what you say you're doing. Um, at, Emma, just bringing, bringing you in here, how, how have you, how have Virgin mm. made progress in this area, I suppose, and how have you turned up the dial to make the progress that you have today? Well, I, I just think tone from the top is really important uh, and that was part of the recommendations from the Women in Finance Charter where we said uh, you know, companies need to appoint an executive uh, who is on the executive committee uh, to lead on this agenda. And actually 70% uh, of the appointed execs are men, which actually I think is hugely helpful. I think firms in general uh, can do more about this by just having their senior people, people like John, out there talking about it uh, and making it clear why this is such an important issue. And it has to be men as well as women. We can't make this just a, a women's debate. But the single biggest thing that made a difference in Virgin Money was our chief executive taking accountability <coughs> and driving the diversity agenda. Yes, we have a people director who uh, he, he leads on the sort of operational elements of it. But it, it's like any other business priority. If you set it as a business priority and uh, you set objectives and you remunerate people accordingly based on how well they're doing, then of course you can shift the dial because you've made it a business problem. And I think the single biggest thing you can do is make it a business problem, not an HR issue. Because whilst it is an HR issue, you will never actually get the traction because it's seen as some sort of social responsibility of, you know, or the responsibility of somebody else. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a really good point. Helen, can I just bring you in there? Because I think one of the things that came out with our research was that um, members, regardless of, of gender or diversity, felt that actually greater diversity throughout an organisation made a better organisation for everybody, so it was fairer for, for all. But I think, is there anything else that you think that needs to be done to, to up the dial further on I mean, I, increasingly, um, I, I've come to, to believe that um, if you're looking at, at society as a whole and why gender pay gaps persist, there's a default in society that childcare and flexible working is primarily a responsibility of women. And I think that you, you know, the real progress will be made where um, men and women are equally sharing parental responsibility in childcare and part-time working and flexible working. Because uh, you know, a lot of the evidence about the, the progression issues that women face is to do with, with, with those combinations. Fascinating to hear from Emily about the take up of shared parental leave because in the economy as a whole it's, it's minute, two or three percent I think to quote a statistic. So, um, and that's not just because men don't want to take up shared parental leave, but if you look at the financial disincentives and um, I, I think that I saw something like the amount of money that is paid to women on maternity leave available to them is something like uh, 
a massive factor more than is available to men because men only get the statutory women, uh, minimum, whereas women can have their pay made up as well. I don't know if, if you address that differently. But there's a lot of incentives stacked against men taking shared parental leave, which I think is sad for men, but it's also reinforcing this default assumption that, that, that it's women who, who take the leave. Um, you know, and I, th I think if you can role model senior men leaving work early to pick up their children, um, you know, advertise all jobs as flexible by, by default, because I think, you know, there the, many men may feel discouraged from asking for or wanting to work flexibly. So I think, you know, if you really want to change the dial, I think you've really got to, you know, organisations and maybe it's the next stage where we'll, we'll need to think about those sorts of issues. Thank you. I'll just... Um yeah, I'm just conscious of time and actually for getting any questions in before, before the end. John, did you have any other stats as your last point that you wanted to raise? Or? Well, I, I'll just underline everything Emily said on, on what needs to happen. And this needs to be traded as a business issue. I have a very simple testament I talk to organisations. I ask them a, a number of simple questions. Um, first is, uh, what metrics do you have around diversity inclusion? If there are any output metrics, if there are any metrics around, for example, the number of women in senior roles, um, they're not going to be across as far as I'm concerned. Um, they need to be input metrics. They need, like any other business issue, where's your action plan? Where are your very specific issues? What specific actions you need to take? Or how you being measured on that? Um, so action plans, scary. It's really scary to see the vast majority of organisations, even those who have good diversity inclusion policies, actually don't have action plans. So that's really important. Um, any business issue, you have someone accountable, you have very clear um, resource groups to have that. And um, by the way, the resources that are placed in the budgets for those in most organisations is a tiny. So please, senior executive, don't tell me you believe this is a business critical issue if you're not putting the resources behind it. So you know, how much resources you put behind it to make, make change really happen? And accountability frameworks right up the top, but also everybody who has any people management responsibilities having very clear accountabilities to make change happen. Treat it like a business issue, and this is absolutely right. Treat it the same way in your business you treat any other business issue. If you're not going to treat it like that, it's an HR issue, as you were saying. Which means, frankly, you're going to get some really good policies, and some decent processes, and some glacial change happen. Thank you so much, and um, thank you to the panel members. Um, I think we've got a couple of minutes, we can maybe do a couple of questions before I hand back to, to Philippa. Um, hopefully you enjoy some, some good conversation and insight from all of the panel, but has anyone got any sort of burning questions before we wrap up? Hi there. I suppose um, one question was about um, the gender pay gap and the fact that maybe women don't have the confidence to ask. So my voice tends to boom in. No, <laughs> and the fact that um, women don't have the confidence to ask. But I think um, what we may not be talking about really deeply is the attitudes and sometimes the internalization of how women are supposed to be. Because when you ask for money as a woman, you generally tend to become unlikable. Because the fact that you think you're worth something societally seems to be deemed arrogant. And I do think that that's something we need to maybe hover over and think about. That's a, a, really, good, a really good point. Thank you for, for that. Um, anybody, anybody else got some questions or thoughts, reflections from the discussion? No. Just conscious of time then. So if we've got obviously time afterwards that you can speak to the panellists um, if you have time before you head off to start the rest of your day. So I'll just hand over to Philippa. Thank you, Philippa. Thank you, Joanne. And, and thank you to all our panel. What I'm turned on. Well, um, thank you to all of our panel um, uh, for their contribution today, and particularly to Joanne, I think masterfully chairing us through all of those questions. Um, I spent most of this morning actually quite uplifted in terms of what we've heard about the positive things that I think are clearly happening within the sector to address the gap uh, that we have in place. I was particularly struck by some of Emily's insights in terms of what Virgin Money are doing and how they're tackling this as a brand issue and really thinking about how their customers feel and experience diversity within their business, um, as well as some of the kind of really pragmatic decision making that you're doing around reward decision making um, and the anti-male diversity bias and that being part of the way that you tackle the gender challenge um, overall. 
It was also really good to hear the examples from John in terms of how that's being replicated elsewhere in the sector. And I started to write down a list of all the insights we've had of different interventions that could be made, and I'm sure I've missed loads. But you know, using data to target the way you use these interventions, thinking about returners for work, unbiased training, tone from the top, the impact of previous salary in terms of not you know, pertaining those gaps over time, the need for role modeling, keep in touch schemes, and this point that Hillary made around transparency and how that can really improve culture change within the business. I also thought it was really interesting that we had the insight from sort of the corporate world, backed up by the research that Hillary's done in terms of the individual experience within the sector. And actually, the real correlation that we heard in terms of the way that those things in combination can make a real difference um, it, together. But there is clearly much more to do. And we've heard a number of times a 35% pay gap and a 60% bonus gap cannot be acceptable going forward. And that to address that, it's not just the policies and processes, but actually culture change that needs to happen. I thought this last point around sort of the pressure that women put on themselves and the view of how um, they are viewed in society overall is a really good one. And how organisations begin to grip that culture change point alongside all the other kind of pragmatic things that need to happen, I think is really, really important. It's particularly important given that the challenge for organisations is expanding. John made the point at the beginning that we're now going to have BAME reporting requirements and diverse and uh, disability reporting requirements. The number of organisations falling into the gender pay gap is going to increase. Um, and therefore, the ability for individuals to compare more organisations over time and take a stronger view about who they join and why, I think becomes even more paramount. So an awful lot to do. An awful lot of information that we've given you today, hopefully helpful. Um, there's lots of bedtime reading at the back for those that want to embrace it, covering most of the research that I think we've covered um, this morning. There's coffee and tea outside, so please do feel free to stay and network um, for the next half hour or so. Talk to our panel members, I'm sure they'll give us a few minutes and, and hang around. Thank you all very much for coming. We really appreciate your time and hope you have a good rest of the day. Thanks very much. Thank you.